Hi. Oh gosh, you can hear me. Great. I can hear myself. Lovely. So thank you so much for having me. I've been speaking at Dev Lab since the, almost, I think the beginning, like almost every year and I've loved coming back. So I'm really thankful to be here. So my name is Jennifer Opal. I am going to be talking about my autism diagnosis and also being a neurodivergent woman in the technology industry. It's something that I'm very passionate about, something that I love to talk about. So I think it's not something that many tend to talk about and share their personal experiences. And it could be something that you might find you're in the same situation in, or you might have someone on your team that's going through something similar or something in the future. So I really hope that you find this useful. So about me, um, I am a multi-awarding DevOps engineer. I'm the founder of the Opal company. We create workshops, we've worked with multiple brands in an effort to teach about new diversity, about inclusion, and about making the workspace safe for new divergent people and for minority groups in the tech industry. Um, I'm also the creator of the opalblog.com. I sit on the board um, for the charity New Diversity in Business. And I'm also a delegate for the United Nations Commission Status of Women, which happened this year too. Um, I have been in the tech industry since, oh my gosh, my awareness of time, 2017, when I first started learning to code. Um, and I will break down and kind of talk about how that kind of randomly happened um, and how I ended up falling in love with it. Um, yeah, so I'll move on to the next one. So I know that being neurodivergent, neurodiversity, ADHD, everyone talks about it. There's, there's documentaries, there's articles. And for some people, they may not necessarily know what it means to be neurodivergent. And from what the definition here, it says neurodivergent describes an individual whose mind and neurocognitive functioning differ significantly from what society considers typical. I tend to use that term in general terms because I have autism, I'm, I'm autistic, I have ADHD, dyslexia, and dyspraxia. And sometimes saying that is a bit of a mouthful. So I kind of just run it down and just say, I'm neurodivergent. And I'll go into detail if you'd like some more details. It looks differently for different people. So only because we're using a general term, it doesn't mean that it presents differently and it's exactly the same for everybody. Um, so what does it look like for me? So when I first found out that I had ADHD, it was a year after I started learning how to code. And I was struggling with reading simple text. And I had an anxiety every time I read text, couldn't remember a thing. I'd read a sentence and I could read the sentence, but can I tell you what, what it is I just read? Absolutely not. Um, so I realized that as I was, really trying to understand and really trying to learn things just wasn't getting into my head I wasn't understanding anything so the definition of ADHD is a neurological disorder that impacts the parts of the brain that help us plan focus on and execute tasks and I know that for some people they'll see these things and be like well we all struggle you know we all struggle with maybe keeping on time maybe planning our day focusing but the difference with ADHD is that it's a symptom that has a significant impact on your day-to-day -day life. So a simple example outside of the tech industry and my day-to-day -day work, for example, something as simple as saying, I need to clean the kitchen today because the plates are piled up and it's a mess and I've been over avoiding it for so long. I can't just say, I'm gonna clean the kitchen. I need to literally write down exactly what I need to do whether it be wash the dishes, whether it be mop the floor, however it is, I have to break down what it is I'm doing to avoid feeling overwhelmed or avoid feeling stressed out and breaking down and then having to kind of run off into my room and hide. Dyslexia, maybe something that some of us have heard of. And it's a learning difficulty that primarily affects the skills involved in accurate and fluent word reading and spelling. I already mentioned before that I struggle to read, and I struggle to absorb information, but I also struggle with spelling. Writing is a huge challenge for me. Sometimes I could be writing something and I don't know how to hold a pen, so it can start to hurt my hands after a while. Dyspraxia is a common disorder affecting fine and or gross motor coordination. 
most people that hear the word dyspraxia, maybe for those that haven't heard of it, it's normally described as you're clumsy, but it could impact many, many areas of yourself. It can impact your working memory, your short-term memory. I can sometimes struggle. I could be walking straight and next thing I know, I think I'm walking straight and I walk right into a window, who knows? Um, and the last thing is autism. And I was diagnosed with uh, autism in February this year. And autism is a lifelong developmental disability, which affects how people communicate and interact with the world. So as an autistic person, something that I always thought that everyone did, we just find a way to kind of navigate life where we get overwhelmed by being in certain situations. And I, I also was diagnosed with anxiety. So I was misdiagnosed, it's actually autism, it wasn't anxiety. So when I think about all of these things, and I know that there's a lot of words here that may be new to some, but learning about this and how it applies to my career and how to navigate how I learn in order to be the best version of myself as a software engineer, as a DevOps engineer, was the best way to ensure that in my day-to-day, as an engineer, I come and I am able to create an environment for myself to learn and be the best version of myself. And even if I'm struggling, I'll know how it looks like so I can bring that into the workplace. If you have any questions as well, you can always ask at the end, so. <laughs> Ooh, that's twice. So what did my career look like? So I started with, um, got my intro to Code First Girls. I was at uni. I was studying to be a psychodynamic therapist. I did not pursue that. I realized that I was the one that needed therapy, babes. It was me. <laughs> I shouldn't be a therapist. I should be uh, in therapy. And um, I dropped out of university. I got into a co-first girls course um, that was in collaboration with BT. And that's where I got my first tech role. Um, as a junior software engineer, and I dropped out and I packed up and I moved to Belfast, Northern Ireland, which is where I still am and absolutely love it. And I'm not coming back here. <laughs> um, definitely come and visit by the way, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, um, as a software engineer there, I worked with a test automation team. We worked on the BT, um, oh, I forgot the name, the BT top boxes, the set top boxes. We worked with the software releases, ensuring that any updates and security updates, we deployed them, we got them out there, we navigated that and worked with other teams to get that done. Um, it was, interesting but it was very repetitive and I just got bored really quickly and I just I couldn't do it I was like I need something else so then while at BT an opening it became available on the big data and analytics team and that's the team that I joined and when I joined the team we were called DevOps big data engineer I don't really know who are really DevOps -y. I think they just heard that word and thought it sounds great here like we have goals so let's just call it DevOps Big Data Engineer. And then I moved on after a couple of years and moved on to DevOps um, as a DevOps engineer at Dropbox. And I was there for two years and um, that, was, that journey was cut short in April where you may have heard about the layoff. And unfortunately I was one of the victims. And um, it was a great journey though. It was a great experience at Dropbox and I really enjoyed it. And it was very interesting work. Throughout that, I had many awards and many accomplishments, and I'm very proud of that. But then I realized that after navigating all of this and pushing through and doing my absolute best to learn, to absorb, to inspire, to teach other people how to code, running courses for free, I wasn't charging, I wasn't doing none of that. Um, it got to a point where it started to exhaust me mentally, and I didn't really fully understand how that looked like. But what would happen is that I would go to work, I would put on a mask and say, good morning, I'd be full of energy. And by the end of the day, I had to go back into bed and wrap myself in a weighted blanket. I wasn't really eating or taking care of myself. As a neurodivergent person, for many of us, we struggle with change. I don't know if anyone's ever been through a restructuring or someone saying that we're just changing things around a little bit, or your job title's gonna change, or they hear about something new and it's like, we're gonna change your job titles from DevOps engineer to SRE. And we're like, what does that mean? We don't know yet, we'll figure it out. And the changes was exhausting. And when you're constantly having to go through changes and there's someone that's very used to routines and needs routines, because that's how my brain works, that's how I operate. 
too many changes can actually be quite a detriment to someone like myself. When the layoff happened, as difficult as that was, it was an absolute blessing in disguise. And I know that sounds so crazy to say, like, how can you be grateful of being laid off and you got fired? But I realized that I was experiencing an autistic burnout. And it was incredibly exhausting to even think about the fact that I'd actually pushed and pushed and put on multiple masks on to navigate my career to this point. Is anyone familiar with the term masking? No? Yes? Lovely. I'll explain it for those that don't. And the best way for me to describe masking is when, and it's normally applied to autistic people, but it may also be broader than that, is when an autistic person is using masks to navigate a neurotypical world. So you, for example, when you're networking and you probably all went and had teas and coffees and you were chatting and, you know, trying to approach each other, I, I'm not going to come and speak to you. And it's not because I don't want to. It's just that it takes an abundance of energy for me to literally mentally prepare myself to speak. That sometimes I have to run off into the bathroom, into a cubicle and just kind of, let me just recharge a bit. I think that for me, when it came to the changes and crashing and burning, I honestly had to find ways of having to navigate myself out of it. And through the burnout, which was actually happening over a period of months, I didn't really think it was that because I was being told by another doctor that it was anxiety. I started to forget things. Things as simple as writing functions in your code. I, I forgot, like, and then it was so simple. Things that I've done multiple times. Couldn't remember how to do those. Meals, I couldn't remember how to cook. Routines that I had that suddenly I just couldn't put into place. And I had to really relearn. And I'm still relearning a lot of things from recovering from that. But to overcome all of that and to get through that, I had to literally just embrace the fact that I am autistic. I am not going to be able to navigate my day-to-day -day life and my career like others. I'm not gonna be able to come to work like other people, like other neurotypical people. I will have to learn how it looks like for me. And when you're going through, when you get diagnosed at the age of 32 and find out you're autistic and you've gone through school and primary school, childhood, and you've been masking and pushing through, when you get that diagnosis, it can be quite devastating. And you start to reflect and wonder what if. And when I found out I was autistic, I was working at Dropbox. It absolutely impacted how I came to work. But the most important thing and the thing that I really valued more than anything was having a team that was just ready to support. What do you need? That makes such a huge difference. Because even someone saying, I could say, I genuinely don't know what I need. I just don't understand. I'm still trying to navigate it. It's a journey that everyone goes through. Well, majority of people go through when they are neurodivergent. I had to say to people, hold me accountable. Learn how to ask for help. Send me a reminder. I know you asked me to type up this, this uh, documentation, but I'm going to forget, or I'm going to struggle, or I, I'm too scared to ask for help. And I know it's something simple for some. We all struggle with asking for help. But when you spend so much time in your head and you're constantly thinking and thinking and thinking, it can, time will just fly by. And time is also something that I'm actually struggle to be aware of. So what helped me navigate all of that to move on and push through and to continue to inspire and encourage and learn again? There were many tools that I used, not just in my day-to-day -day when I found out that I was autistic while I was working at Dropbox, but also outside of that. The biggest key thing was therapy. And it's something that I would always encourage people to look at, even when you are in the workplace, even when you feel like you don't have anything to talk about. Your mental health and the way that it impacts us affects us in many, many, many different ways. Some of us can push through in our day-to-day -day lives and be like, I've got this, I need to talk to no one, I'm good. 
But sometimes a therapist can literally ask you one question, how are you? And you just tell them everything. It makes such a difference to me, but it also makes a difference to how you come to work too. Mental health days, taking the day off once a month for you to just simply rest and to be unapologetic about it. We work in an industry that is incredibly fast paced. Things are changing all the time. Like even when ChatGPT like came out, everyone suddenly talking about it around me and so many things I had to learn. I'm like, whoa, this is a lot. It can be overwhelming, but we should not feel guilty for taking leave, not feel guilty for taking a day of rest. And in the day of rest, you do not have to be productive. You can simply just rest. Rest is productive. And it really helps you in your day-to-day. -day. It helps you at work and it helps you in your home life too. Medication. For me, as someone that has, oh, sorry. Um, for me, that, as someone that has ADHD, I do take medication. There's a lot of stigma about taking medication. But the whole point of medication, it's an accommodation. I need it to be able to function in my day-to-day. -day. I need to be able to be present. I need to be able to exist and to navigate life. My ADHD hasn't gone away, but this helps me. Having an understanding team, it's so important whether you're in work or outside of work to practice inclusion. No one ever knows what anyone else is going through. Many times I say that I'm neurodivergent or I have disabilities. They're like, you don't look autistic. You don't look dyslexic. You don't look like you have ADHD. But what does that look like? Anyone in here could have that. How would you know? So it's important to just have a general understanding that there are some people that will come on that Zoom call, on that stand up, and they might be going through some things. They might have gotten a diagnosis themselves and is trying to understand that. A lot of neurodivergent people go through a grief process and reflecting on what if they'd have known sooner. I definitely went through that and it was devastating. And having to go through that and navigate my day-to-day -day at work and meeting deadlines, sourcing, it's a lot. I use a screen reader and I use a Pomodoro technique to help me read. Because if you think for one second, I'm a dyslexic, I'm going to read all that documentation, you're crazy. Not without, not without my tools, not without my friend. <laughs> Having accommodations available, and you don't even have to have a diagnosis. For some companies, I'll say that when I was at Dropbox, we had a, a diary almost, like a, an archive of tools that you can use to help you. If there was something that you needed, you can just ask for it. That's it. Some of us do struggle to read, we might not necessarily be dyslexic, or we might get overwhelmed by reading. A screen reader is there as an option, nothing wrong with that. If it's, a, if, it, if it's a way for you to learn and for you to just navigate, go for it, ask for it. Having an understanding team as well is the most important thing. I keep coming back to that, but an inclusive team that practices inclusion to make it, make it safe for people to come to work as their full selves makes such a difference. Sometimes there's a saying that says that someone that will leave a company is not leaving the company because of the company, they might be leaving just because of the manager or the team. It might not necessarily be what they're working on. What they're working on could be exciting and interesting. They could be working on that robot that was chasing you in the last presentation. But when you have a team that just understands that it exists, that makes such a difference. It definitely made a difference to me. I wouldn't have gotten to the point that I have in my career, in my tech journey, if it wasn't for having people around me and community around me to help me understand um, and to support me. And AI tools, I know we touched on it a lot, we've talked about that a lot today, but for myself, for example, using um, ChatGPT. No, I don't put no confidential information there. I, I'm, I'm smart, I'm smart. But using ChatGPT to help me to type up an email because I don't know what to say. Using it to help me break down my day because I don't know how to navigate it or I'm feeling overwhelmed and it feels like too much of a task. Using tools like Speechify 
to help me read text on my phone. And then the last thing was self-acceptance. And I think for that could be used for a variety of things. It's not just for when you find out that you're neurodivergent or if you're navigating that, but also just knowing that we're all human. We're in industries that are exhausting, it's tiring, constant changes. And people are gonna look to you and be like, what is this? And you have to learn about it. And that takes a lot of mental space. And it's so important to make space, not just for learning those things, it's just, it's part of our jobs, part of our careers, but also taking time and space to rest from learning all those things. Because a lot of information that you're absorbing some resources here that talks about intersectionality, um, books here about demystifying disability. Autism is a disability. My ADHD is a disability. There are people around you that you might think that you don't have, you might have an image of what you think disabled looks like, but it can look like many things. A lot of neurodivergent people don't even tell their colleagues that they're neurodivergent because they're not sure if it's safe to do so. Can you imagine how different work life would be for a lot of people if we just let them know that they can actually just be themselves, that they can ask for help, that they can just let you know that I'm not 100% today. That makes such a difference. I've got a QR code here, and if you wanted to go on my website, and learn more and I also have resources on the opalblog.com which I will put the books that I just listed there there's loads more books that I'm still typing up but I'm, I'm terrible with deadlines so that's my excuse but um yeah in summary as an as someone that is autistic that has ADHD many of us were creative we're problem solvers we think differently we spot patterns that some of us might not necessarily see. We love just being able to just tap into what makes being neurodivergent just so incredible and so different and so exciting in some ways. But it is difficult too. It is difficult to navigate. And in case I didn't mention as well, that so I, I was diagnosed with autism level one, which means that I have low support needs. So there are up to three levels, um, but that's the one that I was diagnosed with. And if you meet someone that is autistic and it shares that with you, how it presents for me doesn't mean it'll present the same for someone else. It does present differently for different people. I hope that you found this insightful and happy Disability Pride Month. And yeah, if you have any questions, do let me know. I'm an open book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. I think that was such an important, insightful talk that we need to be having more of these conversations. So thank you so, so much for thank being here. You. Honestly, this was, uh, I really enjoyed it. Let's take a seat and yeah. we'll go to, we've got a bit of time so we can do some questions. Um, QR code, you know the drill by now, QR code, uh, or if you want to be brave and, and ask in real life, then we can absolutely do that as well. Do we have one down here at the front? <laughs> so my question is based around... Mike is coming. Mike. My question is based around, um, say you've maybe got the diagnosis or you know that you're, you are neurodivergent, um, but you've also got team deadlines and you don't necessarily want to let people down, but you may be, may be feeling overwhelmed. How do you prioritise? How do you navigate that? So I think when it comes to that, the worst thing I believe that you can do is keep it to yourself. I think if you feel safe enough to be able to disclose that with your manager or even just a friend that's in a similar um, working environment, I think it's important to share it with somebody so that they can help you navigate it. Understand what there's are, there are some teams and organizations where we don't feel included or invited and that asking for accommodations feels like something that's really overwhelming because it's not something that's discussed. But if you able to, if you have a safe environment, if you feel comfortable us talking to a manager about it, let them know that I'm gonna need some support 
or let them know that you're going through some changes. And that's okay. If you're not comfortable asking your manager to express that, ask a, ask a friend who you trust to ask them to hold you accountable. They don't need to know the details of what you're working on because that's something that I had to deal with too. But I have friends outside of work that are also neurodivergent. So sometimes things like body doubling, that they are holding you accountable and you have a Pomodoro timer, they don't need to talk to you on the phone. But having that presence of someone there makes you feel like there's someone holding you accountable so you can get something done. There are ways of being able to find support around you to help you to navigate your day-to-day -day at work. Sometimes they're hard to find, definitely. Um, I know that there are websites as well where people do body doubling and just don't say anything or getting on a Zoom call and body doubling with a colleague. They don't need to know what's happening. Um, but it depends on the environment that you're in. If you feel safe, don't be afraid to share it. If you're not ready to share and you don't feel safe, ask a friend around you or someone in the ADHD community. I've even asked, sent a tweet once and had some random person be like, let's go on a Twitter space and let's just sit here and not say nothing. I didn't know who this person was. And I still don't know. There was somewhere in America, but it was great. You know, you'd be surprised just how many people will be willing and happy to help and support you. And when you feel ready to share, it will happen in your own timing. And when you're, when you're ready, you will know that. And you don't have to share it, but when you're ready to, that option's there for you. Fantastic. Thank you. We're, we've got so many questions in Slido, actually. Oh, wow. Can you, can okay. You keep them coming, everybody. Um, one that, that I personally want to ask as well, which is, is, I think, a great question that a lot of us might be feeling, mm. um, is how do I know if I'm overwhelmed in a normal way um, or if I need extra support? Mm. I think that the difference between a, norm, a normal way and if it's extra support is if, it, if you notice that it's happening consistently. If it's happening consistently in more ways than one and you cannot handle yourself in that situation, that's when I feel like you need to speak to someone about that. Before I found out about my autism diagnosis, I said I was, I was misdiagnosed with anxiety. And I said I had an anxiety disorder, that's why. But the, the reason why that was happening, even just leading up to that autism, leading up to that anxiety diagnosis that I would share, I was having um I guess you could say almost like a meltdown while I was on a zoom call and I was rocking aggressively from side to side and I just couldn't stop it was something that I just hadn't experienced before and I've had meltdowns from when I was a teenager but it was always like oh you've got anger issues like you're being over dramatic and it's like no I have literally shut down when you start to notice that it's a pattern and it's happening more and more and more and you don't and you can't or struggling to find strategies to help you in that moment whether it be at work or outside of it that's when you need to speak to someone and that's when you need help and there's nothing wrong with that by the way <laughs> definitely definitely not there's nothing wrong with with asking for help mm -hmm. um and yeah we've got we've got quite a few questions coming in about how to ask for help if those conversations maybe aren't being had in the workplace maybe they don't have um you know, infrastructure set up or, or maybe nobody has ever really mentioned it before. How do you go about having the courage to be the first one to ask, ask for help, ask for support? Yeah, that's a tough one because it's something that I still struggle with as well. Ask for help is so hard. Um, and I find that I struggle a lot because I will try and figure out the solution on my own that I spend so much time in my head that I was a fly by and I realized that it's the end of the day and I need to log off and, and just like sign off for it's 5 p.m. You don't pay me after that. But at the same time, I didn't do anything until then. Um, and then you start to feel guilty. And then you take that question that you wanted to ask, you take it home, you take it to bed, you take it to your dinner table or with your partner. And it, it overwhelms and it's, it's constantly just playing in your head. I think for me, the, the best strategy that I've had to kind of ask, my, ask myself is, the best strategy that I found for myself is writing down the question to understand what it is that I'm actually needing help with. Because for some people, I say for myself, I think that I know what I asked, but it wasn't received in the way that I actually asked it. So I actually have to be like, I, I would like a coffee. And they're like, you would like a coffee or do you want a coffee? Like what, what is it? Like, what exactly are you saying to me? And it's about sometimes being more specific. 
So maybe writing down your question, but also thinking about the best way that you prefer to communicate. Would you be comfortable enough saying this on the Zoom call? Do you have Slack? Do you prefer to just send a message and just type up what your question, maybe write down your question on a notepad and then type it in and have that conversation. I think also we tend to overthink and we have a fear of rejection as well because we think that what the question that we're asking is stupid or it's silly, but no question is ever too silly. And as many of us might be programmers or even just working in tech, like there's no such thing as a silly question. So think about how best you would prefer to communicate, you're comfortable communicating with your team manager or someone in your team and just express that this is what I need help with. And if it's a case where, it's someone in your team that you don't like, you don't feel comfortable asking this question to anyone on your team. If it's a question that you can ask with someone, maybe in a tech community, maybe one of your friends, and just ask them the question, maybe they have experience and in the same line of work, reach out to them if you're comfortable with that. I find asking questions by typing easier. Don't call me. I don't, don't ask me to, don't call me. I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to type it. Don't call me, but it helps. And it just saves me so much stress. So then I go home and I'm not thinking about asking a question to help me solve this issue that I was having with one of the Grafana dashboards that literally I could have asked my senior, like, senior member um, of my team and got an answer like that because they worked at Grafana. Like, and now I'm stressing. But like, it could have, like, I think that, you know, that helps me and I hope that answers the question or helps provide some ideas on what direction you can take. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you. As I just, as we're talking about this, I think it's really important to note how tricky this, this can be to talk about. Oh yeah. So uh, thank you for sharing and oh, being so open please. with this. I think it's, I think it's important. We all need to have these conversations more. Um, there's a few questions coming in here about you, because you mentioned that you're, you were diagnosed, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of, you know, young kids get diagnosed with ADHD or autism, right? Mm -hmm. So coming to it later, mm -hmm. um, was there anything that that kind of made you go and seek the diagnosis, or what, were there any signs that that you saw, or anything that you want to share that we could look out for and maybe sure. ask? So this is going to sound so wild. I <laughs> so I had a feeling and knew that I was dyslexic from when I was about six. So I was in primary school. Don't ask me how I even came across the word dyslexia at six. Like, don't even ask me. I just know that it's something I just had in the back of my mind. I didn't get diagnosed until I was 20. So I was just 20, this is 28, so I was 27, 27. But when I went to get my assessment, I had no idea that I was dyspraxic and I had no idea that I had ADHD. And I'd never heard of either of them. So I had to understand and learn what they are and how it has shown up in my life. And the reason why I feel that it took me so long to even know that I had ADHD, my whole family has ADHD. We probably discovered late, later on in life. So like, like I've got like, yeah, I'm, I'm one of four, so I have three younger brothers. They all also got diagnosed later on in life. All of them have ADHD. So being in a family where we all have conversations and goes on tangents and, our conversations be sounding like a like like a like a cobweb shooting out of Spider Man or like a tube map, and it just goes everywhere. And then we're like, "All right, cool, see you later." And we all just go in our rooms and hide. And it's just like not hide, but more so just to kind of self soothe from like socializing. And um, I didn't know it was normal. It was just something that we all had. Why would we ask the question if we're all literally exactly the same? We were all described as bright and energetic and funny. And I'd like to think that I still am. But like, when it comes to that, like, why would you ask the question? So discovering it later on in life and, and understanding how it looks like, I found that some of the struggles that I had in terms of with ADHD, um, memory issues, not being able to remember things. And people forget, like people forget their keys. You know, people forget their phone on the bus. People do all that type of stuff. But I was forgetting things that people would bring up that I don't remember. Even things from my childhood. I couldn't remember some things. My brother would be like, do you remember that time that you, you cracked that glass table in our dining room? I'm like, what glass table in the dining room? And they had clear recollection of it. And so did my mom. And my, I had no recollection. And it's like, how is it that I don't remember something that everyone else remembers? 
So memory, um, trouble with sticking to routines, struggle with change. I talked about how like sometimes I've like, been at work, um, we went through so many like restructuring. Oh my gosh, like it was, it was a lot. I didn't know what my job was. I didn't know what we were supposed to do day one, day two. I have ownership of this on Monday. Then it changed something else on Friday. I didn't know what was happening. I don't do well with change. If there's no consistency and stability, you can forget it. I won't be able to, I won't be able to navigate. But um, when it comes to dyslexia, if you're reading text and you can read the text, but you can't actually say what it is that you just read, and that happens a lot, it might be something that you want to look into because that's something that's very common behavior for people that are dyslexic. If you find that like you can start reading a page and you can struggle to lo you lose track quite often about where you picked up from, that's something that you can explore and ask questions about. It happens to loads of people. But when it becomes a point where it's starting to become an impairment and impact your day-to-day -day life, that's when you have to ask questions. Same thing with someone asking the question about feeling overwhelmed and it's happened when you know when to ask for help. When it's becoming an impairment, when it's affecting your day-to-day -day life, when it's affecting your, your, your diet, when it's affecting how you communicate with people, are you like maybe you're surrounded by your family and everyone's having a conversation but you're zoning out so many things so just little things it will you'll start to notice them and if you start to notice that it's happening often and you start to just reflect on that that would be the best time to just reach out to a medical professional and ask for help with that um when it comes to the autism diagnosis that was accidental as well like i didn't know where that came from but um I started therapy, literally just started therapy because I had quite the year. Um, and from talking with a clinical psychologist, the first session that we had, and she said, has anyone ever said to you that you might be autistic? And I'm there like, why would you say that? And then she was like, in order for us to progress with therapy and understand how that looks like, we need to just do this assessment first. But even though I had autism in the back of my mind, I never actually pursued a diagnosis so I've already got ADHD and dyslexia and dyspraxia I'm like I don't I just I just I, I just can't add any more things to my basket today and um I ended up having to add it in anyway um but after understanding with autism for example there were things that I was able to do before that I could no longer do now things that I found very self-soothing for example like doing deep dives like for me I had like a special interest in like technology and data and and I just loved like I'd watch documentaries about data and I could watch them on loop. Like I know the words for documentaries on, on big day on, on Netflix without the captions. It's just, it, it's just something that I just find so exciting. And I'll, I'll react to it as if I've watched it for the first time. So sometimes like maybe it's a special interest that you have. Maybe it's just the way it's showing up in your behavior or maybe like your, your partner or a close friend has noticed something. I think that's when you can ask the question. But for some of us, like, you might not know until you decide that, hey, I just want to have therapy and talk to someone about some things that's been on my mind. And it doesn't have to be work-related. It can be things to do with your childhood. It can be things to do with things you went up through in school. Sometimes when you're going through therapy, you're removing layers of yourself. And as you're removing layers of yourself, something can reveal itself. For me, it was finding out that I was a little bit autistic. And I had to embrace that. And, I, and I'm, I'm learning to embrace it. I'm learning how to understand it. I'm 32. I have to learn what that is and how that looks like. And there were things that I had in place before that just don't work now. Going to the gym and having a routine and knowing exactly what to do. I had to learn. I don't know how to do that. So I have to learn how to do that again. Even changes to food, porridge. If it's not a particular brand, I just can't eat it. And I know it sounds so crazy. But you notice some different little things that just feel so strange to me. And I'm learning now that, okay, it didn't work before, but I'm going to learn how it looks like for me now. So it's a lot of change. It's a lot to process. It's going to take time to navigate it, but it's not impossible to navigate it. I love that. It's not, it's not impossible, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked earlier a little bit about... Um, experiencing burnout and kind of realizing that mm -hmm. it's the things that you were feeling were a result of burnout 
Um, what did you then do? Like, how do you personally deal with that? How do you cope with that? How, do you have any mechanisms or, or, or ways of, of coping that maybe people here could try? Yeah, so I think the first thing was I had to, well, I'm lucky enough that I had a, ther- a therapist to be able to discuss that with them. I think speaking to a mental health professional and speak, and when I say mental health professional, it's important to try and find a therapist that has like a real understanding of neurodiversity and disabilities, because I've, I've had therapists that have caused me much more harm than good because they had an understanding of it and made me feel so much worse. And it took a long time for me to get out of that. So for me at the moment, my therapist is a clinical psychologist. Um, they tend to have a lot more knowledge of the brain, how it works, which I think is how they picked up my autism before I even knew. But um, if you're able to get access to a therapist, that'd be amazing. If not, some things that I try when I am feeling overwhelmed, I have a weighted blanket. For me, the heavier, the better. Um, You can find them on Amazon and you can get different weights and some of them work for you, some of them won't. Just kind of experiment and see how it works for you. But when I'm feeling overwhelmed, I just have to kind of find it somewhere quiet wrap myself in this blanket it feels like a really big heavy hug and there's no one there but me and it's great I find that lights sometimes in my home I have to have them dimmed down it gets too much if I have the lights on too much night and I forget that I had them on I might wear sunglasses in the house for example um, just to help me to calm down going for walks taking I, I say it's a bit difficult one, like um, meditation works for some people. It doesn't work for me. I have to go outside. I can't stay in the house, <laughs> but it works for me. Um, but I think that when you are going through a autistic, because an autistic burnout is different from a regular burnout. So an autistic burnout tends to kind of take time to progress and get into, because an autistic burnout is, is brought on when you have been masking, when an autistic person has been masking for so long and they get to a point where they just can't continue to mask anymore. It's kind of like going on a stage and performing and then you get tired of the script from playing, from playing that script over and over again and you just have to get off the stage. That's autistic burnout. Regular burnout tends to come from a different angle with that, um, but it is something that you can recover from. Um, but I would definitely suggest that therapy is an, is an amazing tool. I know that some organizations offer that as an option for you too. So maybe look at mental health support within the workplace, mental health support outside of it. Um, if you would prefer to not go down the NHS routes, there are options for finding therapists online. So I use a website called psychology today. So it has a huge directory. So you don't have to go into a physical office. You can find therapists that are available online and maybe you pay between maybe 50 or 100 pounds a session, depending on the type of therapist that you find. Um, But I would say that the the best step for me, therapy, making sure you get outside, touch some grass. Grass is just so good for you. It helps you. And it sounds, it might be like, oh God, it's just going outside. It is going outside. It helps so much. I've reco- it has helped me so much. I could literally talk about this all day. I really couldn't. But yeah. <laughs> Massive advocate for getting out of the house. Get outside. I- yeah. <laughs> you just need to be in the real world and remember that it's not all as bad as it I'd might seem. Or just add, don't feel guilty if this, if your mental state is impacting your day to day. It's not your fault. You cannot fight what your brain is, to- is doing, what your body is doing. And we can go to work, like sometimes when we like, we can go to bed carrying all of this and feeling guilty because we weren't productive or we didn't start that project that we were supposed to do. or We didn't read that book or reply to that letter or file those taxes or whatever it is because we just physically and mentally just couldn't do it. And we wanted to, but don't feel guilty if you can't. It's not you that can't, that doesn't want to do it because you want to do it. It's your body and your brain telling you that they physically can't do it. So you have to just try and find the tools to say, okay, how do I just recover for myself first? Once you learn how to do that, whether it be that you're neurodivergent or not, you will start to see the effects and how it will actually show up in other areas of your life, whether it be at work, at home, with your families, with your friends, 
when you want to socialize everything it will show up and you'll see the difference be patient with yourself give yourself time I'm still myself still recovering from burnout and I'm still in therapy every every couple of weeks now it helps but you have to learn to be patient with yourself be forgiving of yourself and just know that you cannot fight what your body won't let you push through and just accept it and, and then move forward from there but yeah <laughs> just one more question uh because i know we're run, running out of time and i could mm-hmm. talk about this all day honestly but um <laughs> we talked a lot about and i know there is a, a stigma around you know disabilities and and having to cope with different things and it all seems a little bit negative and and trying to be normal but whatever that means mm. but do you do you find that there's any benefits or anything anything that is a a good thing uh about your disabilities yeah, like I find that I'm really, I find that I'm quite creative. I like the fact that I can think of different ideas. Like, there's nothing more exciting when you, when everyone is like looking at trying to solve a problem and I find the solution to the problem or I find like a, another angle and they're like, I didn't think of that. And I'm like, <laughs> um, it's just, it, it just motivates you and it encourages you. Um, we're very empathetic. We're understanding. We're, we're, as a dyslexic person, we're, we're great storytellers. We have quite an imagination. We see things differently because we live in a world that wasn't built for the neurodivergent brain. So the way that we navigate things is different. The way that we see things is different. And I find that very, very exciting. And I've had, I had, and I had to, I decided to just learn to embrace that there's an amazing side to being neurodivergent. It's hard also. There wouldn't be medication for ADHD if it wasn't something that people struggle with. And I definitely struggle with it. But you learn to kind of just navigate it. And it's possible to do that. But I find it really exciting. And I don't even have a degree and I made it. So <laughs> I guess my brain is cool for something. <laughs> Amazing to end on that. Perfect. Thank you so, so much again for, for joining us. I think that was really useful for, for everybody, especially for myself, for sure. Um, so massive round of applause, please. For Janice.